Sorry. Okay, so again, I'd like to just say thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's really been a pleasure, and uh, uh, I hope that you uh, enjoy the art exhibition. Please, uh, I haven't given this talk before, so if you have any questions, please ask, and if you see any mistakes, please let me know, and I'll try and fix them in case I ever get to give this talk again. So um, my name is Saul Schleimer. I'm from the University of Warwick. Uh, do I have to push this? Uh, my name is Saul Schleimer from the University of Work, and I'm going to talk about minimal and ciphered surfaces. Um, so first of all, let me just start with surfaces, because uh, I'm not supposed to assume that everyone's a mathematician um, or even a topologist. So what's a surface? So the key thing to understand is what is dimension. So dimension is measuring degrees of freedom. So for example, if you're an acrobat on a high wire, then you basically have one degree of freedom unless something's gone really badly wrong. OK, right? You can move backwards and forwards. And that's one degree of freedom, not two, because backwards is the negative of forwards. And positive and negative numbers fit into a line. That's just one degree of freedom. So if you're an ice skater on a rink or a person walking around on a stage, you basically have two degrees of freedom. You can kind of hop up and down a little bit. But that's not really a third degree of freedom. You can move forwards and back, right and left, two degrees of freedom. And if you're an astronaut in outer space with a jet pack, then you have a full three degrees of freedom. You can move up and down, as well as backwards and forwards and right and left. So those are dimensions. And we live in three-dimensional space. And I want to talk about something which is strictly easier than three-dimensional space, which you've been living in all your life. So you're well equipped to understand what I'm going to say. I want to talk about surfaces, which are two-dimensional. So a surface is locally a two-dimensional thing. At every point on a surface, you have two degrees of freedom, uh, except uh, unless you don't. So let me say what the, the, let me say the one exception. So the one exception. Uh, is coming from the boundary. So here's one of the simplest surfaces there is, and it's the disk. It's a little like a, a, a beer coaster. That's a disk. That's a perfect round disk, OK? Uh, very useful as well. And at the edge of the beer coaster, there's this, there's this rim. And you can't go past that. So at the boundary, you have one less degree of freedom. In other words, the boundary of a surface is one dimensional, not two dimensional. You have half less. Well, you could go back in, right? But if you stay on the boundary, then you have exactly one less. That's right. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, I take. You have, yes. So the boundary, the boundary is definitely special, and we could, uh, and and it's it's very interesting. If we get rid of the boundary, if we take two disks and glue them together along their boundary, then we get a sphere. And the first disk becomes the northern hemisphere, and the second disk becomes the southern hemisphere. And we glue them together. This process of taking two copies of something and gluing them together along the common boundary that's called doubling, and that will be very important for this talk. So once again, just to make sure it's perfectly clear, I take a disk, I take an identical copy of the disk, and then I identify them just along their boundary points. And then I get a sphere. That's called doubling the disk. So uh, there are other surfaces. Uh, at the, very, the second slide, I had a rogues gallery of six surfaces. Let me say the, sec the third and the fourth now. This is a picture of an annulus. That's a disk with another smaller disk cut out. Um, another way to think of this is if you take a rectangle of paper and you glue the short ends together, then you'll get an annulus. And if you take an annulus and double it across its boundary, now it has two boundary components, but doubling is still well defined. You still take two copies of the annulus and glue them together across the boundary points. Then you get what's drawn here, which is a torus. And you can kind of see the annulus in the torus. There's two ways to see it. You could take the torus, that's a fancy name for the boundary of a bagel, that's like the icing on a bagel. No, icing on a donut, or the poppy seeds on a bagel. It's important to not confuse your food metaphors. If you take just the icing on a donut, and you cut it just uh, vertically with this slice, then you'll cut it in two circles. The first one's marked, and the second one isn't marked. And you get these two pieces, and those are both annuli. Or you could cut it horizontally, and again, you get a pair of annuli. Okay? So that's two ways to see that the torus is, in fact, a pair of annuli glued together. There's another way to get the torus, which will come up later which is you could take um, a square and glue opposite boundaries in pairs. And that will also give you a torus. And there's various ways to see that. Um, let me move on to the next set of surfaces, which are the Mobius band and the Klein bottle. And so a Mobius band, that's what you get if you take a strip of paper, give it a half twist, and then glue the, the short ends. And if you double the Mobius band, then you'll get the Klein bottle. And let me see, I think I had one prepared. I've got a Mobius band here. Okay? So if you look, 
This is if you, a strip of paper and you get three half twists and you glue it together. So the rule is an even number of half twists will give you an annulus, and an odd number of half twists will give you a Mobius band. And with something very, very cool, the boundary changes depending on how many half twists you give it. So uh, in my Mobius band over there, which just had a single half twist, the boundary is just a, a sort of a curve. Would it be OK if I close this door? Sorry about that. So uh, maybe we'll see a picture later. But this annulus, if you follow the boundary curve, it's not too complicated. You could see how you could maybe stretch it out and make it a round circle. But this guy here, the boundary curve is pretty cool, and it's actually what we call a trefoil knot. And I'll come back to that later. So um, I'm not going to spend quite as much time on these, but it's possible to have much bigger surfaces. So we define something called the genus of a surface. And the genus is the number of handles. It's like you have a piece of luggage, and it's got a handle on the top and a handle on the side, and maybe a sneaky handle underneath, which looks like it's part of the base, but actually you could stick your hand through it. So that would be a sphere, because that's what a piece of luggage is. It's a, it's a sack for containing stuff. And then you put handles on it to help you carry. Right? So this is a surface with two handles and one boundary component. If I double it across the boundary, then I'll get a surface of genus 4. So that is sort of a beginning introduction to surfaces. Let me talk about how surfaces come up in geometry. And these are often called minimal surfaces. So when we're talking about minimal surfaces, the thing that we're minimizing is area. Um, let me say there's two major ways that I know of of talking about area. There's Plateau's problem and the isoparametric problem. There are soap films and there are soap bubbles. OK, so what's a soap film? You take a piece of wire, and you bend it into some cool shape, and you get a big vat of soap. The bigger, the better, because I mean, it's fun to clean up. And then you dip it, the wire, into the soap bucket, and you pull it out, and you get some cool thing with like shimmering patterns, and it buckles in and out. Or you could take a, a very simple wire, which is just a loop, and you could put a film of soap on it. You could blow, and you'll get soap bubbles. So what are the two problems of area? If you take the wire then what the soap film is doing is it's minimizing the area needed to span that wire. This is the surface with the least area that has that boundary. There's lots of different surfaces that have that particular boundary, right? If you blow on the surface on the soap film a little, then it'll, it'll wiggle back and forth, and you'll get other surfaces, right, which still have the same boundary. But this one is supposed to be the one with the least area. That's Plateau's problem. The isoparametric problem is the soap bubble that's the least area surface, which encloses that much volume. So this guy, it looks down a dimension to see what its constraint is. And this guy, it looks up a dimension to see its constraint. Right? To say, I, I mean, to say the least area surface makes no sense. Here's a sphere. What's the least area sphere? We'll just shrink it. Right? Or what's the biggest sphere? We'll just keep making it bigger. There is no smallest sphere or largest sphere. But if we add a constraint, namely it has to have a given boundary or it has to contain a certain volume, then we get a much better problem, which we can solve. And it's solved by, uh, well, this sort of saddle-shaped surface or this sphere. And, and this is really a key thing to notice. I'm going to mostly talk about the plateaus problem for the rest of the, well, for the, for the next half of the talk. And here's, here's a really crucial thing to notice, which is this constraint being the least area, the best surface for a given boundary, that gives the surface a geometry. When I was talking about disk, I said, oh, it's a coaster. Oh, it's an upper hemisphere. I had all these different shapes, and I wasn't being very particular. right? It's because I'm a topologist, and I'm not bothered. But if you're a geometer, you care about the shapes of surfaces. And one way to pick a best surface is to say, oh, let's have the surface which solves Plateau's problem. right? We'll specify what the boundary is, and then we'll pick the least area surface. I'm lying a little bit, because there might not be a unique least area surface, and it's really a local minimum, not a global minimum. But anyway, it doesn't matter. This helps you find a geometry. Now, I just said I'm a topologist, and I don't care. And now I'm talking about geometry, and they do care. So what's the story? You can't print topological objects. You have to print geometric things. You have to have a geometry. You have to actually have the thing in three space and tell it to the computer so it can spit out the plastic. Right? When you're printing something, you're making a choice. So the idea is make the best choice. <laughs> so you have to decide what best means, and that's another choice. And then, but let's just stop there. You have to make the best choice. And for us, the best choice is the one where you're making the fewest choices. I guess that's a little meta. 
you're making the fewest choices, when the geometry tells you there's this canonical object, like the least area surface, that's really good. It's like, oh, well, we just have to find that. We just have to find the mathematical description, and then we can give it to the computer, and we don't have to do too much work. It's not like we have to choose the right color scheme, or wiggle a little bit, or this surface is too wide or too skinny. It's like, no, the geometry says it has to look like that, given the boundary, so we print that one. So this is, this is maybe this should have gone on the first slide. This is our uh, philosophy. Don't make too many choices. Look for a canonical object and print that. So, and often we, will, we'll, often we can use area to make that choice. Uh, great. So here is a disk and a sphere. Um, I think I said all this. This guy is very saddle-shaped. This guy is very round. I'm mostly interested in this guy. Um, and let me just say one thing about the geometry here. You can see that there's this cool saddle right there. But actually, near the boundary here, it gets pretty flat. OK? So there, it is saddle-shaped, but the saddle is mostly near the center. And then it, it sort of flattens out near the boundary. Um, so we, we like the first guys, not the second guys. Let's move forward. If I have an annulus and I want to make it a minimal surface, then the solution to that problem is called the catenoid. This is an annulus of minimal area. If you take two wires, which are the same radius circle, and you dip them in the soap film, and you hold them parallel, very important, then you get the catenoid. Um, it, there's a wonderful theorem due to Riemann, I believe, which is if you change the radius of one of the circles, or you move the circles, but staying in parallel planes, then you'll always get a surface, not a catenoid, but you'll always get a surface which is a union of circles. They'll sort of shrink down until you get to a smallest one, and then they'll open up again. There's always this mouth. And all those circles live in the same parallel family of planes. Um, that's not relevant to the talk at all, but it was super cool, and I came across it while uh, uh, getting ready. So. Um, all right, so here is a minimal surface in the shape of an annulus. Again, let's notice that um, it's actually got, this is more saddle shape than we had before. Before we had sort of one point, which was a saddle. Now there's this mouth right here, around here, where there's these saddles. Uh, but again, it kind of flattens out near the boundary. So um, I should try and say why. Why is it saddle shaped? So the best I can say, because I don't understand it completely myself, is that a minimal surface wants to be more negatively curved than the space that it's in. So there's, there's three kinds of surfaces. There's three kinds of geometry. There's positive curvature, which is like a bit of a sphere. There's zero curvature, which is flat. And there's negative curvature, which is saddle-shaped. And the reasons why they have the names positive, zero, negative is something to do with you know, second derivatives and whether things go up or down. Who cares? Positive curvature is like, uh, is like a sphere. Uh, zero curvature is like a plane. We got plenty of those. And uh, saddle-shaped um, is like the catenoid. <laughs> right there. OK. Um, so when a surface is trying to be minimal, it wants to be more negatively curved than its surrounding space. right? This is R3, which is flat, so it's trying to be negatively curved. But it's not really doing a perfect job. It's still getting a little flat near the boundary. There's another way to solve this particular problem. There's another way to make the annulus a minimal surface. And that is the Hopf band. So Henry was already talking about the three sphere. You take R3, and you add a point, And you get a space which is very round. It's even rounder than the two sphere. OK? We, if we measure roundness by how many kind of symmetries it has, how many um, ways to rotate, then S3 is much more round than uh, S2. The three sphere is more round than the two sphere in some sense. So this is a picture of an object in the three sphere that's been stereographically projected into uh, R3. And I claim that this is, um, well, what am I trying to say? This surface is actually completely flat. Doesn't look flat, but in S3, I claim this is completely flat. Um, and can I give evidence of that? Yes, I can. This thing down here is a parameterization. And this parameterization, you know what? I, I'm going to come back to the flatness of this. I said it's completely flat. And now, let me just point out, uh, there's actually two uh, uh, Hoff bands. There's the one on the outside. Uh, let me show you again. There's the one on the inside. There's the one on the outside. And there's both of them at the same time. Okay. And if you take the union of the two Hoff bands, Remember, you take an annulus and another annulus, and you glue them together, you get a torus. So this is the Clifford torus. And let me show you the next Clifford torus, um, which is right here. So you can see this outside. This is actually a picture from the exhibit. 
And what I want to point out is that there's these circles. Okay? And these circles all are meeting at right angles to each other. So if you take a, uh, a plane and you code it with circles, that's showing you that it's flat. Right? We have this family of equally spaced squares um, marching along in every direction, and nothing is getting stretched. That is the sort of the definition of flatness. This thing is a flat torus. But it's sitting in S3. And remember, a minimal surface wants to be more negatively curved than its ambient surroundings. So the three sphere is super round. It's positively curved. This thing is flat. It's got zero curvature. So that means it looks like it's negatively curved. It, lo it looks like it has saddles everywhere. And in fact, you can even see the saddles. There's a saddle right down. In fact, let me back up one picture. Uh, there it is. You can see that there's a saddle down here. And there's, uh, there's saddles all around here. OK, now it looks kind of flat here, but that's because stereographic projection distorts geometry. I claim this thing has saddles everywhere in S3. And uh, the reason why is because this thing um, is very symmetric. You can send any point to any other by a symmetry. So if it's got a saddle in one point, it has saddles everywhere. So this thing has saddles everywhere. In S3, this thing is a minimal surface, and it wants to be, it, it thinks it's negatively curved, although really it's flat. Right? It's more negatively curved than its surrounding space. So um, that was the disk, the sphere, uh, the annulus, and the torus. So what's left? Yes? Surfaces Why are they intersecting? Why aren't they? Oh, um, because we, they are not. We were very careful. They meet only in their boundary, because that's what doubling is. So if we go back, there's the disk and the disk, and we double, and we get two disks glued together, and that gives a sphere, which is a nice embedded surface. You're asking about why don't they crash like this? Yeah, in okay. this situation, in this particular situation, because I feel like they are, or like the way I imagine it, it should, but it's not, I don't know. So there's a lot of stuff in this picture. There's this red line, which is one boundary of an annulus. There's this other red circle, they're actually perfect circles, which is another boundary of the annulus. And then we're gluing the annuli together across their boundary. And then there's shading. You could, the surface is just ever so translucent. So you can see through the surface, and you can see sort of a visual tangent line. This is a place, this shading right here, that's a place where the surface is bending behind a layer. Yeah. But actually, it's embedded. It's a torus. So if you go back. Oh, yeah? OK, back, back. back. You can see that, yeah, uh, one more. You can see the two circles. They're the same two circles. Yeah, yeah, the circles are always supposed to be in the same position on the, on the slide. Does that answer your question? Yeah. OK, so if you want something to intersect, then I can do that for you too, which is you take a Mobius band. OK, so this is an annulus. Well, so those guys didn't intersect because we were careful about the way we put them together. But these guys will intersect because no matter how careful you are, they always must intersect. So here's what we do. We take a Mobius band. Remember, that's a strip of paper with a single half twist, and you glue it together. And um, I said the boundary of the Mobius band, it depends on how many half twists you use. If you just use one half twist, then the boundary is just a loop in space. But if you use several half twists, then you might get a knot. So this is what you get if you take the boundary of the Mobius band and you pull it tight to be a circle. So this is also outside in the exhibit. And again, I give a parameterization. And um, before I said you could stare at the parameterization for a sufficiently long time, and you could see that the thing is flat. But here there are these nasty twos, and it won't be flat. And in fact, you can see that it's got more curvature. There's more saddle-shaped areas than we had before. OK, so what we do is we take two Mobius bands. Here's one Mobius band. And here's an identical Mobius band rotated by 90 degrees. Right? This guy, its long axis is here, horizontal. Here, the long axis is vertical. You just take the union of those two Mobius bands, i.e., double across the boundary, and you get a Klein bottom. And now, here's that intersection that you're asking about. There is no way to embed the Klein bottle in three space without self intersections. Right? And in my cartoon picture, I had one self intersection curve. And in this picture, I have a different uh, self intersection curve. And here, you can see that the self intersection curve, there's this beautiful symmetry, fourfold rotation around it. And that's because this is an optimal representative. Right? The other guy, the cartoon, had no particularly nice symmetries. And this one does. Um, right, I should mention, since. Oh, can go back one, one slide, please? Yes. There seem to be two boundary circles, or more than Ah, OK. Well, so this is the, this is the old finances problem. 
So to get this really maximal symmetry, we need to put the projection point, the point infinity, on the surface. OK? So the one circle here, that is the boundary of the Mobius band. And then we had to cut away a disk so that we don't go off to infinity. So this is, I mean, you're right. This is really the Mobius band with a little square cut out of the center. And we put the projection point there. And the square is small in the Mobius band, but it's big in the model because, well, let me tra trace it with my finger. It starts here. There's one boundary of the square, one side of the square, another side, a third side, and then there's a fourth side there. OK? Does that, does that answer your question? OK, good. So uh, two Mobius bands gives me a Klein bottle. And I should say, all of these minimal surfaces in S3 are special cases of a construction due to Blaine uh, Lawson in his paper, uh, I'm forgetting the title, Complete Minimal Surfaces in S3, published in 1970. Um, and I mentioned that because we will return to his examples perhaps at the end of the talk. Oh, no. Here is a picture of a higher genus surface. Um, uh, the render is due to Nicholas Schmidt and Tubingen. And uh, this guy has genus 6. And you can kind of sort of see it. Remember I said the genus is the number of handles. So each one of these tubes, that's a handle. And if you count, you see exactly seven of them, which is too many. But uh, the point is that there's sort of a ball up here. There's a sphere up here. And there's another sphere sort of out here. And the first tube just connects those two spheres together. So that's not really a handle. But the next six do actually count as handles. And that, that's why this has genus six. Um, cool. Um, any questions? That's it for minimal surfaces for the time being. Um, in that case, I will go on to ciphered surfaces. So we've already seen one knot in the talk. There was the trefoil knot, which is the boundary of the triply twisted Mobius band. So let me just say what knots are. A knot is a loop in space, right? So we have a piece of string, and you can tie it in a knot, and then you must join the ends together. Because a piece of string with free ends, you can always untie it by doubling back. You can always untie your shoelaces. No matter how knotted up they get, you just sort of double back along the shoelace and you can clean things out. But if you join the ends together, you can't necessarily unknot it. So uh, since knots are just top topological things, it's just a loop in space, you can push it around, con continuously deform it is the, is the term. There's no, they don't come to us with a, a best position. So we'd like to find the best position. Uh, this thing is very symmetric, so it seems like it has a pretty good position already. So here's the family of knots that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about torus knots. So it's a torus knot if it lies on the torus, basically. So where's the torus? There's the torus. So we have this yellow torus. And you can see that this guy, it goes up out of the hole, down behind, through the hole again, and around, and around, and around it goes. And it goes. Uh, it, it hits the outside, so it goes four times around. Uh, no, sorry. It goes four times through the hole and three times around the whole thing. It looks like it goes four times around the whole thing, but actually it's three times. Uh, let's count together, shall we? I'm going to start here. And every time I get back to this slice of the bagel, I want you to add one to the number. So what's the number right now? Zero, zero right? We start counting at zero. Very important. OK, good. So I'm going around. I'm going around. Just yell at me when I cross the slice again? One. OK, very good. No, 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 no. That's a slice on the other side. We only count when we cross this slice. All right, let's start over again. What do we start at? Zero. Zero. OK, so I'll start counting. No, 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 no. Yeah, this is on the other side. Three. Right, because that's at the end. So we go around the bagel three times, and we go through the hole four times. So this is the four-three torus knot. It lives on the torus, uh, and it, we count the number of times it goes through and around, and that gives us the numbers. Actually, for any rational number p on q, there is a torus knot, and the sign of the torus knot tells you the handedness. There are right-handed and left-handed torus knots. Um, good. So I said I promised you that the torus was really a square. There's a square. And if you draw a straight line on the, the square, then when you glue the opposite sides, we, maybe I should have put little symbols here, which says that they're supposed to be glued up in pairs. 
when you glue the opposite sides in pairs, then this red line will close up to be a torus knot. And it turns out the slope of this red line is minus 3 fourths. Okay? It's a negatively sloped line because it's going down. And it meets this side. How many times does it meet this side? One, two, three, four. That's the same as this one. And how many times does it meet this side? One, two, three. That's the same as that one. Three times. So that's going through and around again. Okay? So torus knots are the same as straight lines on the torus. Right? And this is, the, this is, by the way, my proof. I claimed it earlier. And here's my proof that the torus is really flat. It wants to be this flat thing. Right? It's made out of a square. It's a piece of the plane. Right? It's not curved like a sphere. It's not bulging like, it's not, it's not curved like a saddle. It's not bulging like a sphere. It's flat like the floor. Good. So, um, <sighs> ciphered surfaces. We've done, talked about knots, torus knots. So um, anytime you have one of these wire frames, you can dip it in the soap solution and pull it out and get some sort of spanning surface, a two-dimensional thing which has the, the wire frame as its boundary. So Seifert talked about these in his paper in 1860-something, I forget. And these are figures from his paper. It's actually on the poster outside. And maybe it's easiest to see the surface in this first one right here. It's easiest to see the surface in this first one right here. <laughs> There's a disk. And we take one band, and we attach it in this kind of loopy way. And we take another band, and we attach it in this loopy way, like that. So it's just a piece of topology, right? We take some surfaces that we already know about, a disk and strips of paper, and we glue them together with various bits of writhe. Right? It's writhing around in three space in some fashion. And what uh, Cypher was doing in his paper is he's taking the writhe, and he's converting it into twists. Right? If you take this band, which is writhing around, and you pull it straight, then the two writhes will turn into four twists, four half twists. And the same thing is happening over here. One writhe turns into two half twists. And then he takes this disk, and he actually twists that. And he separates this one disk into two disks, the upper and the lower one. And you get these three half twists. Uh, sorry, one, two, three. Yes, three half twists. And there you are. I think I made a mistake. I think that this is one, two, three, four. Something is wrong. One, two, three, four. Yeah, two rides gives you four half twists. These are pictures. These are Seifert's pictures. Yes. So they're probably okay. They're probably okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if you count over here, you see seven, minus three, and five half twists. Um, so I've, and there's definitely four here and two here. Oh, I think that twisting this guy must give another two. All right, I'm not going to worry about it. If they're his pictures anyway, right? If there's a mistake, then we'll just let him know. OK, good. So that's what a ciphered surface is. It's a surface that spans the knot. And he's just giving a sequence of three pictures, which shows you how to straighten the knot out. And then the ciphered surface gets twisted up a little bit. So what we should do, oh, well, the reason why ciphered surfaces are so cool is because they connect the knot, which is this one-dimensional thing, with its ambient space, which is a three-dimensional thing. Good. So. Now we're going to do this for torus knots. Um, and there's actually a very cool way to do this without using any topology at all. You use what's called the Milner fiber. So here is um, an equation right there. Z to the P plus W to the Q. Right? P and Q are the two numbers we had for our torus knot. And we think of Z and W uh, as being complex coordinates. And we just get this equation, and we solve it in the complex two-dimensional space, and we intersect the solution with S3, and we get the torus knot, which is kind of awesome. So whatever this means, and it doesn't so much, uh, it's, it's sort of relevant, um, and it sort of isn't, it's saying that there's this completely implicit way of describing the torus knot. Right? We're not parametrizing the torus knot. I'm not giving a recipe, oh, at time five, you're at point blah de blah I'm saying this is a test for whether or not you lie on the torus knot. This is an implicit description of the torus knot as opposed to an explicit description. This is a cutting it out by an equation, not describing it by a parameterization. Um, OK, good. And now we can sort of take this equation and torture it a little bit. We can take the argument and set it equal to theta. And that will describe this is one complex condition, so it gives something one dimensional in S3. This is one real condition, so it gives something two dimensional in S3. 
So there's some yoga of counting dimensions. Uh, and if you do it correctly, you see that this gives something two-dimensional. And as you vary theta, you get a family of surfaces. And they kind of move through space. They move through this three-sphere. They fill it up with surfaces. Um, so hopefully on the, oh, sorry. So uh, I actually, I could have said this before. <laughs> Not used to having so much cool stuff with me. Um, so here is a torus knot, and instead of getting too interrupted now, I'll just pass these around, and you can compute what P and Q are for them. Three and two. That's the, that's the, that's the torus, that's the trefoil knot that appears in the logo. Okay, so I want to, maybe I should take another moment. I said that this describes the Milner fiber. This is some equation which cuts it out. So let me give a simpler model. If you look at the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, okay, that's an equation, and it describes the circle in the plane. Yeah? Or I could say cosine theta comma sine theta. right? And as theta varies, that also describes the circle in the plane. So the first description is implicit. It gives us a test, but it doesn't give us any point on the circle. If I say, oh, 3 comma 2, is that on the circle? Well, 3 squared, 9 plus 25, that seems like it's too big. That's not equal to 1. That's not on the circle, right? If I, wanna, um, if I want a point on the circle, then I can say, OK, take cosine of pi comma sine of pi, and I'll get a point on the circle. It's actually the one over there. So <laughs> the cool thing is that sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, right? So these two descriptions actually go together. The implicit and the explicit description go together. So Milner gives us an implicit description of the Milner fiber, and we want an explicit description. So let me say how to do that. Is that okay? Are there any questions at this point? This is sort of more, this is more hardcore, and so if you have questions, then this is a good time to ask. When you write this argument of the procedure, then this P plus WP is not equal to zero anymore? Right, yeah, that's a good question, huh? Because <laughs> <laughs> zero doesn't have an argument. <laughs> so this thing gives you a surface in S3, except at the knot. Because on the knot, right, so this equation intersected with S3, that defines the knot. That's where the argument vanishes. All of these surfaces in S3, they have the knot in common. So the argument, so we're good to go. Does that make sense? In other words, where this is undefined, that's the boundary of the surface. And this is how the boundaries are special. Right? We move to the boundary, and the argument's constant, 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 boom, it's undefined. That's where we have to stop. Does that answer your question? Yes. Good. So we like Milner fibers because they give us ciphered surfaces for torus knots. Okay? So we want to build these ciphered surfaces. The Milner fiber is clearly the most awesome ciphered surface for torus knots. You couldn't do any better. But it's not enough to have an implicit description. We need a parameterization so we can give it to the printer. All right? So that's what we're going to do. Are there other questions? This is another good place to ask questions. So the Milner fiber is actually a surface related to the knot. Yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. So this is, this is the knot. This describes the knot in S3. This describes the Milner fiber in S3. And as you move around to the surface, the argument's constant, until you get to the boundary where the argument becomes undefined and you arrive at the knot. Actually, let me, let me maybe show, on, just to give the game away, I'm going to describe how to build these guys. So here's an example for the 3-3 three, three torus link. I've always been talking about knots, which are loops in space, but you could take a collection of loops, and you get something equally well-defined. Equally well so this thing is a surface. Yeah, it's locally two-dimensional until you get to the boundary, where you hit the boundary there. And it turns out it's got three boundary components, because 3 and 3 are not co-prime. In fact, the GCD of 3 and 3 is 3, so there's going to be three components. Yeah, so there's some number theory. Um, and this thing is the minimal, well, sorry, not the minimal surface. This thing is the Milner fiber, or at least a 3D print of it. So let's describe how we, we parameterize the Milner fiber. And this is um, not so easy, as it turns out. So the first step is we're not going to parameterize the whole Milner fiber. We're not going to parameterize the whole surface. We're just going to parameterize a little chunk. 
So we start with this Euclidean triangle, and the angle here is pi on 4, and the angle here is pi on 3. Okay? Because we were looking at the 4, 3 torus knot before, or the minus 3 on 4 torus knot, whichever it was. And we'll start with this Euclidean triangle with angle pi on 4 and pi on 3. And this angle, has whatever, this angle is whatever it needs to be, and we cut out a little, we just take a bite out of the corner right there. And I'll say why we do that in a moment. So the first thing we do is we map the Euclidean triangle to the Poincaré disk. So here's this famous Poincaré disk. It's a model of hyperbolic space. There's the little bite that's been removed. It still seems completely unnecessary. And look at how distorted geometry is. This corner, where we're going to increase angle by a factor of 4, things get really squeezed. And at this corner, where we increase angle by a factor of 3, things get squeezed a lot, but not as much. Okay? And you see how the, all these nice, beautiful Euclidean straight lines, they get turned into curvy, weird objects. Okay? We do this by inverting the um, schwartz christoffel map. Uh, and this, is, uh, this requires some, this is a difficult operation. Here's something much easier. We take the Poincaré disk model, and we use a schwartz christoffel map to map it to this red triangle. So here's this very special point, which was the image of the point of order 4, and it's going to another point of order 4, right? Again, the angle is going to be pi on 4. Here's a special point. It's getting mapped to the uh, point of angle pi on 3. And this byte, now I can explain it, it's getting mapped to infinity. Okay? In the hyperbolic plane, there's these points at infinity. There's some points at infinity down here. You can see that everything's becoming very crowded. And there's a p one point at infinity up here. And if we didn't take this byte out, then the surface would just go up all the way. Our maps would not be very, uh, well, we, we'd have numerical problems, actually. So this is not easy, but again, it's not so difficult. Um, so here is maybe where the magic happens. We want to map this triangle, this red triangle, to a fundamental domain for this tiling of the Seifert surface. So this is a picture of the 4-3 Seifert surface. And if you have the, that guy there, Glenn, could you maybe hold that up? Right? So this thing, it's the 3-3 Seifert surface. And it's actually got 3 times 3 times 2. It's got 18 fundamental domains in it. Okay? So this guy is the 4-3, so it's got 3 times 4 times 2, 24 fundamental domains. So we want to take this red guy and map it onto here. Um, maybe in the... So this is a long involved story. And some of it is actually in Milner's paper. You have to think about the ring of fractional automorphic forms. And this ring turns out to have two generators. It's a two generator ring. It's a two generator algebra. Um, and you pick those two generators, and those uh, give you automorphic forms, and that gives you a map of the hyperbolic plane, well, the tangent bundle of the hyperbolic plane, to C2, right? And remember, S3 lives in C2, so if you normalize things correctly, then the, that pair of automorphic forms gives you a pair of coordinates in uh, C2, and the automorphic forms have this magical relationship that if you take the pth power of one and the qth power of the other and add them together, then you get something non-vanishing. And that's exactly the kind of thing you need in order to map from the plane to C2 and then into S3. And then we stereographically project and get this object. OK, so um, the rest of the talk, there's no math. It's just a sequence of pretty pictures. So let's just relax and look at those. Uh, here's the 3-3 three, three, uh, colored. Um, you notice? Around. No, OK, so that's an excellent question. So the one that you're passing around, where is it now? Oh, could you hold that up? Right. So that's got the same thickness everywhere, if you kind of stare at it. Thank you very much. This guy is super thin near the knot, near the link, and it's kind of chunky and thick away from the link. And the reason why is because we thickened that guy in R3. That's the, three, that's the flat thickening. But we thickened this guy in S3. Right? And remember, the well, pff, OK, so first of all, this is kind of close to infinity. This is far away from infinity. That's the origin. That's, as far from, that's the south pole. That's as far from infinity as you can get. The closer you get to infinity, the more geometry distorts, the more things blow up. You saw that in Henry's uh, flashlight demonstrations. right? But there's another thing going on here, which is the way we thickened is not by thickening up in S3. We thickened up using the elliptic flow. So remember, I said that there's these fractional automorphic forms, and you get a map of the unit tangent bundle of H2 into S3, into C2, um, actually into S3. And when you rotate in the unit tangent bundle, you move along these flow lines. 
And when you move around in the base, then you move on the ciphered surface. Okay? So we use these flow lines that you see kind of decorating this uh, fantastical lamp-shaped thing. These are all round circles, and they're what you do if you rotate in the hyperbolic plane. Um, and you can see that as they, well, maybe that's, is there anything else I should say? Is there anything else I should say about them? No. Okay, so let me just make an advertisement for canonical choices, right? The philosophy is make as few choices as possible, right? So you see, when you make as few choices as possible, you get unexpected s side effects, right? We gave a canonical parameterization of the ciphered surface. We said, here's the right map from the Euclidean plane to the ciphered surface. Right? And as a bonus, we, got, we, found, we were told how to move the ciphered surface off of itself, how to flow in the three-sphere, orthog well, not quite orthogonal, but transverse to the ciphered surface. OK, so here's, how we, or, or here's a sequence of pictures which sort of illustrates the Milner fiber. And as a bonus, I'm going to not show you the Milner fiber. I'm going to show you the doubled Milner fiber. So remember, the Milner fiber is the surface, and it's, it's connected to the knot. right? And if you double, then you get two copies. So Remember I had this theta? This is going to be the Milner fibers that roughly angles theta, zero, theta equals 0 and theta equal 180. Okay? That's how you double. You take two copies and glue. And here we have a canonical way to glue, by, given to us by the angle. All right, so here's the trefoil knot. And uh, sorry, not the trefoil knot. This is actually, I think, a Turk's head knot. Um, but the torus knot, there's the torus. Let's get rid of the torus. Uh, sorry, let's turn the torus on the side get rid of it, and let's zoom in a little bit, because the cipher surface is pretty complicated, and I want to show you just a small piece of it. So, uh, and we make the knot a little less uh, intrusive. So, this is, if I can show you, two fundamental domains. So this guy is the point of angle um, four, I believe, and this is the one of angle three. And what I did is I doubled across the knot, right? There's this red guy, which is a bit of the knot, and I'm taking just the fundamental domain, and I'm doubling it across. Um, and if that's not completely true, then hopefully no one will uh, catch me in lying. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, take copies of this gadget walking around the knot. Okay? So what I'm doing is I'm developing out fundamental domains. And I'm taking them two at a time. So uh, one of these belongs to the, cipher, to the Milner fiber at angle zero, and the other one belongs to the Milner fiber at angle 180. So let's, this is kind of bigger, so let's back away. And now we've got this lens of fundamental domains. Uh, there's eight of them there uh, in four groups of two. So let's take copies of the lens. And notice what happened, right? Things rotate in order to glue together nicely. If I just moved straight down, then I would get things which were meeting like this at an angle, right? So what I do is I move down and I rotate by one quarter. That's avoiding this, trend, this crashing through problem, right? I could take, I could take uh, right here, I could take one, two, three, four more copies of the fundamental domain, right? And then I'd have surfaces which are meeting like this, and when I double, they'd crash through. Yeah? So this is related to your question earlier. OK, so now I take a lens, and I make a copy, and I make another copy, and I make another copy. This one is going off to infinity. And I make another copy, and there's the last copy. There's the doubled ciphered surface. And the red thing is the torus knot. Um, and now uh, let me just show you. Here's the one at angle 0 because it goes through the origin. And here's the one at angle uh, pi, because it goes off to infinity. And there's the, Milner, there's the doubled Milner fiber, the whole thing. So here's a question that one could ask. Are, minimal fibers, are Milner fibers minimal surfaces? Whew, that's difficult to say. Uh, and the answer is no. No, they're not. Right? So this is the loss in surface. And this is the corresponding. Uh, doubled Milner fiber for the 7-2 torus knot. And um, they don't really look anything alike. And in fact, they're not the same. And so here's, uh, there's a test due to Shang, uh, which tells you when a surface is minimal. So you can just shove the minimal, Milner fiber in. And the answer is no, they're not minimal surfaces. But <laughs> it's still true that the Milner fiber and the Lawson surface are equivariantly um, isotopic. They both have exactly the same symmetry group, and you can move one to the other, preserving the symmetry group. So that's kind of a weird thing that I don't really understand. Um, here's some more stuff that I don't understand. Here's the fundamental domain, kind of looking at it head on. Actually, two fundamental domains. There's this one and that one. Here's one special point. There's the other one, and there's the knot, and there's the double, the double of it. 
And obviously, I could take, there's this mirror plane right there. Yeah, you can't, can't, tell, the, can't tell the difference. There's both of them together. I just superimpose them, <laughs> excuse me, Henry superimposed them on the computer. And you can see that they're all touching everywhere. They're the same surface. This is a computer proof, if you like, that there's this reflection symmetry. Um, and I don't know why the reflection symmetry is there. I'd very much like to know. You can also see the reflection symmetry here, right? The knot. Oh, OK. So when you reflect, you change the sign. So the first knot was the minus 3, 4 torus knot. So the other one is the 3, 4. Yeah. When you reflect, you just go over. Uh, you can also see the reflection symmetry here. Um, there's other things we don't know. Um, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll just go to the last slide. And thank you very much. Are there any other questions? I'm going to you came back. No, the loss in surfaces are, are, are honestly minimal. But, so, um, um, the curvature is definitely variable, right? Because you saw these big monkey saddles. So they'll flatten out there. But other places, they're negative. What's that? They're, no, they're not positive anywhere, no. So, so in fact, let me, let me try and answer your question. If you look at the Lawson surfaces, they look like this. Okay? They really do, right? So what Lawson did is he says, take a geodesic tetrahedron in the sphere. Let me, let me try and draw it for you. So here's one axis. Here's one component of the hop link, and here's the other component of the hop link. And if you choose two points here, and you choose two points here, and you take the convex hull, then you get a spherical tetrahedron. Okay? And Lawson, his cool theorem is that if you take a circuit of length 4 on that tetrahedron, and take the minimal, then the minimal spanning surface exists. Lawson's cool annals papers in 1970 is about wireframes and soap bubbles in three-sphere. That's what it is, right? We do wireframes and soap and soap films in R3, so he's doing it in S3, and that's why he gets an Alice paper. That's, that's good, okay? So, and he says this thing exists. There's a minimal surface which spans this tetrahedron, and then if you take the reflections and do exactly what I did, then you get a closed surface of the correct genus. That's his surface. So our surface, well, Milner's surface <laughs> has exactly the same property. It's spanning. This spherical tetrahedron, yeah, and if you take copies in this way, only every, you checkerboard only every other tetrahedron, not all tetrahedra, then you get uh, the doubled Milner fiber. So that's the proof that loss in surface and the doubled Milner fiber are equivalently isotopic. But you can just you can see with your eyes that they're not the same, right? This guy, the somehow the the every tube has a mouth, right? Every annulus has a, some sort of mouth. And the mouth here and the mouth there, they kind of match. But these guys, there's this huge mouth and a really small one, and they're not, they're not matching up. Yes? What's this? Zeta 6-1, is it the name of the surface? Yeah, zeta 6, that's, his, that's Lawson's notation. You know what? This is a bad example to be showing. It's not related to multiple zeta values, right? No, 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 no. Well, not in an obvious way. We shouldn't be showing this, because uh, when you look at when P and Q are not equal, this is maybe not the best example. When P and Q are not equal, then they're only when P and Q are equal is there a chance of them being the same. Right. And even then, it's not true. But I, I, could, I, could, I could try and fool you by showing you the, the Milner fiber for the 3-3 and the loss in surface. It would be a 2-2 here. The loss, uh, if I showed you uh, psi 2-2, then it would re they would look much similar. Actually. But they're still not the same. Are there other questions? Yes. It's a big question. I, you can say no. But can you say something about the other toys that haven't? Yes. This is Henry's favorite. I can say that. Current favorite. Um, so we were talking about the hyperbolic plane. And we talked about two different models, the Poincaré disk and the upper half plane model. So if you want to try and so, and we even showed a tiling by these triangles. Oh, 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 here. Oh, oh, yeah. Here's a little bit of the Poincaré disk model. And there's a tiling by triangles here, right? This is the 7, 3, 2 triangle, OK? So if you take these triangles and you try and build it in Euclidean space, then something has to go wrong, 
But it's an interesting question of how far you can get. And so here is a surface, and I'll hand it, and I'll hand it to you. Um, and you can count the, the degrees of all the triangles. These triangles are equilateral, but they're still oh. different numbers. Oh. You're lying. Oh, I'm lying. I'm lying. These triangles are not equilateral, for sure. Um, and you can count how many there are around each vertex. This is an attempt to develop sort of combinatorial hyperbolic plane into Euclidean space. Um, and I believe it is an open question, which was considered, uh, Rick Schwartz tells me, no one knows if you can have a combinatorial hyperbolic plane in Euclidean space. Hilbert proves there's no smooth map uh, isometric embedding of the hy hyperbolic plane into Euclidean space. But that doesn't rule out a non-smooth map. Hilbert's theorem needs that the map be C2. And this is definitely not C2. It's not even C1. It's got, sorry, it is, it is continuous. It's C0, but it's not C1. It has bends. Um, are there other ones that you would like to? Yeah, okay. Um, between the, the beach ball cube and what well, like, right. to this side of that one, yeah. Well, I'll let Henry explain this one. Okay. <laughs> maybe we should let people go if they're... Uh... Maybe... Maybe there's other questions for... I'm sorry. Yeah, maybe we should thank the speakers and the people who want extra information should stick around because... Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's, we're, we're over our time. Thank you very much.